afraid a bad guy's gonna come and shoot you in the head. That's just you're afraid of. We said it would take a year for the place to be taken over by the Jihad, and what happened instead? It took a half a year. There is a simple solution for peace. We live on our tribal ancestral lands, they live in their lands nearby, and we work together for a better future. The West, when dealing with bad guys, used to know that you don't you don't like go all liberal on them. You go hard on them. They tell you, let's divide Jerusalem. You say, if you say that word one more time, I never want to speak to you again. Well, after you did to me what you did in Gaza, we wipe you guys out like this. That's who we are around here. We're majnoon. We're crazy. You don't mess with us. Yay. This is not good. Right, exactly. There they are. There they are. Okay. Hi, everybody. Manishma. What are we, Hebrew speakers or English speakers? English. Both. English. So we do it in English, is that why? Yeah. Why is that? Should we do it in Hebrew? Yes. <laughs> so we'll do a little bit. We'll do a little bit of both. Um, my name is Yishai. Wait, before, my name is Yishai. I live in Efrat. I'm today an Efrat uh, city councilman of the, as of last week. Yes, that's right, that's right. We had big elections in the country, uh, so that was good for me. Um, Baruch Hashem, I hope it's good for, for the rest. Um, uh, I am the spokesman for the Jewish community of Hebron, and we were supposed to have this talk in Hebron, but you guys canceled. Why is that? Why is that? Why did you cancel? What? Your parents don't allow you to go there. Okay. Yeah. Don't feel safe. Don't feel safe. Okay. We do it every year. Yeah. Every year we do it. Okay. In the Vahada, a lot of people were concerned about the possible security risks because the Ramadan was just beginning. Oh, so that's the answer. The Ramadan. So we're scared of the Ramadan. So we're, we're scared of the Ramadan. Political? You're afraid of the politics? What is it that we're afraid of? The politics? Do you think somebody's going to... Not the politics, but every time Ramadan comes around... Come on, come on, say it, say it. You know what I'm trying to get to. We're not afraid of the politics. That's not why you're not there today. You're afraid of the riots. The if you're afraid of the te- security. That's just a, just a whitewashed word. So you're afraid of terrorism. You're afraid somebody's going to shoot and kill you. So just say what it is. Don't say the politics, the political situation. You're afraid a bad guy's going to come and shoot you in the head. That's just you're afraid of. And you think that the Ramadan means more bad guys doing more of that stuff, more likely. So let's just be let's just be real about what the what Ramadan does. It keeps us out of Hebron. Let's be real about what Hamas uh, did down in the south. Let's just see. They they came out of Gaza. They burnt houses, and the, you know what else they did? And now we like went backwards, and now we have like a we're like afraid of them. So a lot of cities are not uh, housed because we have a lot of our people removed, uh, evacuated from those areas, right? So and the same thing in the north. So basically, the Ramadan, the Jihad, the Hamas, they shrink us. They're interested in shrinking us. In fact, that's what I want to talk about today, and I'll get to it in just a second. I just want to know where you guys are from mostly. Where are you from? London. London town? Okay, good. Where at? London. Where in London? London. I know London. Huh? Finchley? Okay, good. Okay, spoke there once. Yeah. Where are you from? Ramle. Huh? Ramle? Ramle. Yofi? Okay. Where are you from? Uh, Connecticut. Where in Connecticut? Stanford. Okay, good. Okay. Where are you from? New York. Where in New York? West. Oh, Westchester. Okay, great. And where are you from? Ashkelon. Ashkelon. One of my favorite places in the world. Yeah. I love Ashkelon. I love Ashkelon. Really, I love Ashkelon. I think I'm going to be running uh, the 10K, the marathon. I know. I think there's a marathon in a few days. Oh. How do you think it's going to be? I don't know. I You'll see me from behind, maybe. No, just joking. No, just joking. Okay. I actually just ran the 5K with my 12-year-old son uh, in Jerusalem. It was fun. So fun. So fun. So fun. Tough besetter. I was like, I was like thinking about what to talk with you guys, what to talk with you about today. I was thinking about it. Now, I have the speech that I usually give this group, but then I was like, you know what? Right now we have to talk about something a little bit more nikudati, a little bit more specific, and that is, what was the October seventh massacre? What is it? What was it? What happened? Why is that important? Because there's a lot of people that want to draw it in different in different ways. They want you to believe that it was about the occupation. Or it was about uh, subjugation, or it was about uh, the tzvi food, what do you call it, the tight living conditions in Gaza, right? They give you all these stories about what this thing was really about. So, let me tell you a little bit about how I know Gaza. By the way, the word Gaza, is that a nice word? Gaza, does that sound nice to you? Like, huh? 
You know, you know, you know, in the ancient world, Gaza, or Aza, or in Arabic, Gaza, was considered one of the most beautiful beaches in the world. It had some of the, when you said Gaza, you're like, I'm going to take you on vacation to Gaza. Wow, okay? And I remember a time where we used to go on vacation, not so long ago, to Gaza, because it was the best beaches. We called it Gush Katif, but it meant Gaza, the Gaza Strip. Okay, let me ask you another word. Lebanon. How does that sound to you? When I say Lebanon, what do you think? Is that a nice word? Does that sound nice to you? Does sound like a nice word or not? It does sound like a nice word. Does not? It does. It does, right? Okay. But for, uh, for your friends, let's say you said the word Lebanon somewhere. You're like, yeah, I went, I went to Lebanon. went to visit Lebanon. How would that sound to them? Oh, not good. Not good, right? You know that the word Lebanon in Hebrew means beauty? Like, hahara Lebanon. Like, it's considered to be, it's supposed to, like, symbolize the Beit HaMikdash was called HaLevanon because it was so grand and beautiful. Okay, and it was also made from the trees of the Lebanon. Okay, the Lebanon is something beautiful. But that word has become to mean something bad. Let me ask you another word, Chevron. Chevron. Nice word or not nice word? Okay? For today, I tell Hebron, I say that to today on the news, it's like, oh my God, he's talking about a place of violence and jihadism and racism and crazy settlers, right? The word Chevron means chaver, chaver. It means, in Arabic, they call it Khalil, which means the same thing, which means friendship. Ibrahim Khalil Allah. Abraham is the friend of Allah. Okay? It's supposed to be a beautiful place. Hebron is an ancient place. 4,500-year-old place. It's supposed to mean something good. Why have these places, Gaza, Hebron, and Lebanon, why have they come to mean these bad things? Why? Why do they mean that? Because I have to go on, I'll answer it for you, okay? Which is, the jihad has taken over these places and turned them into hell. Gaza was, not so long ago, in 2005, my wife and I went down to try to block, I was working for Arutz Sheva, Israel National News, uh, I, they, we tried to block the country of Israel from removing itself from the Gaza Strip. What did we say back then? What was our rationale? Do you know what we said? Shim not nimet ze nitenod. Shim not nimet ze ze afok liot moked shel Right? That if we leave Gaza, it'll become a forward base of the jihad. And you know what people said to us? No, it'll never happen. And you see, you'll give them land, they'll be peaceful. And they said to us, you'll see that if they start with us, we'll be really strong. Boom, we're going to smash them. They, you know, the, the Israeli tough guy talking. We're like, no, guys, no. This is a bad idea. You walk out of your land, your ancestral land. You give it over to the PLO. It'll be taken over by somebody. We didn't know who was called Hamas. It could have been Al-Qaeda, and it could have been ISIS, and it could have been any of these guys. Same thing, really. There's no difference, right? Just a little difference in ideologies. You give away that land, they will take that land over and make it a forward base uh, of the jihad. We'll get to questions, okay? They'll make it a forward base of the jihad. And so, and so we were like, don't do this. And you know who else told us not to do it? The mm -hmm. Arabs. The Arabs that I was working with and living next to and dealing with all the time, they were like through fences. I remember their hands. I just remember this image that they had their fingers through the fence like this and they were saying to me, Yishai, they said, don't leave. You don't understand who's going to take over this land. They're going, the jihad is going to take over. It's going to squash us average decent Arabs. It's going to destroy our lives. It's going to take away our freedoms. It's going to also uh, uh, take our children and brainwash them to jihadism. So the Arabs said, don't do it. Don't walk away from your land and turn us over to the jihad because these jihadis that are coming, they're going to suppress us. They're going to be violent against us. If we say things like, I think I want to be friends with the Jews, they're going to cream us, crush us, kill us. They're going to take our kids, brainwash them. Don't leave this land. Don't do it. It's dumb. And it's against the rules of the Middle East. There are rules in the Middle East. You don't give up land for peace. You think that sounds, doesn't that sound nice? Here, I'm going to say something nice to you. I have something that's, you know this watch? You see this watch? It's really important to me. It's a really important watch to me. It's my army watch. I want to give you this watch. Even though it's important to me, I want to give it to you for, for peace, because I want to have peace with you. So take this watch. Does that sound nice? It sounds kind of nice, right? But in the Middle East, what the other side hears is, this guy, Isha, is a total weakling. He's willing to give up his, his watch or his land for peace. That means he is spineless. He's willing to give his mother or his wife over to us. He's spineless. He doesn't hold on to what's his. He's not a man. It, and that's the discussion of the Middle East. And so we said to them, don't do this thing. We tried. <laughs> All my friends were arrested. I was carried out of my house by the police. Because we were like, listen, we're doing you a favor. Please do not do this. Bad things are going to happen. Go back to the record of 2005. 
Nobody wants to talk about it today because it's embarrassing. Because they're like, we didn't, nobody knew, nobody expected this to happen. Nobody expected something like this to ever happen. Yeah, right? We said it was going to happen. It wasn't we. It wasn't me and my wife. It was a humongous group of people. We went to the Likud, got the Likud to vote against it. The whole, like, 70% of the Likud voted against it. We tried that. We tried, politi- we tried everything we could to stop this thing from happening. And instead they did it. And what happened? We said it would take a year for the place to be taken over by the jihad. And what happened instead? It took a half a year. A half a year, the Hamas got rid of the PLO. Not that there's any difference between them. They're just the same sides of the, uh, two sides of the same coin. One is a suit wearing jihad, and the other one is a jihad, you know, a, a kafia wearing uh, jihad. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. But the bottom line is that they, they took it over, and now we had war after war after war. And then finally we got to this place where, where again, the same people who think in the same way after being hit over and over again, they have what we call in Israel, conceptia, right? They have this concept that, that somehow things are going to get better. We have a recording of the chief of Israeli intelligence of the army saying three months before October 7th, saying Hamas is murta, that means that they are, um, what's the word, what's the word? Uh, 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 wait, wait, deterrence, they're deterred and that they want governance and peace. He would have them say that. In the meantime, they're planning for a year or two years this big attack on us. And our heads of intelligence, you know, that Israeli intelligence, you know, Shemona Matayim, they know everything. They don't know shit, okay? They don't know what's going on right under their nose. And we, a guy like me who was a paratrooper and not in intelligence, is like, I think they're building tunnels to destroy us. I think they're making an army to fight against us. Stop being so naive and dumb. Stop being so naive and dumb. Stop sending money from Qatar to fund these guys. Stop giving them cement and other things. You know where it's going. Stop allowing UNRWA to teach them jihadism. Stop. Stop doing stupid things. Look at the big, look where this is going. And our vaunted intelligence was unable to identify that these guys are building a whole tunnel system underneath in order to create this horrible thing. Do you know how nice of a day it is? It's really nice. I mean, really, really, really nice. And at the same time, we have what? 130 hostages? Huge, 100, huh? 134, how many? Uh, we, have, we have land that we've lost, basically, because, because, because the jihadists pushed us back and now we're afraid of them. We got kids in the classroom in a beautiful place in Yerushalayim who are afraid to go to Hebron because the jihad controls them, because it's Ramadan. And we say all kinds of words in order to not say what we really mean. Oh, because of Ramadan, because of political... You mean you're scared of the bad guys? who have taken over large chunks of land. Let's just say what it is. Let's just say what's really going on around here. I used to speak in America, I speak in America a lot, I, I used to speak before October 7th, and people would be like, Ishai, you're a little bit exaggerating. You know, Israel's the strongest country around here in the Middle East. You got the biggest army and the biggest economy. And I was like, you know what? That's your perspective. That is not my perspective. My perspective is we have 150,000 rockets aimed at us from Lebanon. We have uh, whatever's happening in Gaza. This was before October 7th. These guys are preparing for war against us. In Judea and Samaria, the so-called West Bank, they're arming themselves to the teeth and teaching jihadism to children. Then you got the Iranian nuclear bomb. You got these dudes called the Houthis that want to cut off our, our waterway system. You got the American campus, the jihad working to, to, to scare the Jewish kids into submission. <laughs> kids at Cooper Union are in a library because the, the, the jihad is banging on the windows and they're all scaredy-like, okay? I said to them, I don't think our situation is that great. I don't think our situation is that great. People would be like, oh man, you're just like a right-wing extremist guy. You're just exaggerating. I'm just like, you want, you're the one who's exaggerating. You want to make a worldview which is like an imagination. You want to think you're the biggest. You want to think you're some kind of, you know, you're in charge of everything, but you're not. And you're not seeing the bad guys as they walk another step and another step towards what they really ultimately want, which is to annihilate, the, to shrink the Jewish state and then to annihilate it. And the problem is, is that we just, we just, we want to live in our little imagination. It's a very nice garden here at Hartman. Very nice. I love it here. I want to come here all the time. But I'm telling you that if you walk just a few kilometers this way, in Yerushalayim, there are no-go zones in Jerusalem. There are neighborhoods that you cannot go in with a kippah. Okay? It's called Isawiya. Okay? It's called, it's called Jabal Mukabir. It's called... Uh, uh, Atur and, and many others and and uh, and, uh, and uh, what are they called over there? Beit Chanina. Uh, uh, what's called next to Beit Chanina? There's tons of neighborhoods around here you can't go into in Jerusalem. 
Let's say you just felt like scro strolling today because you just felt like it. You just wanted to go to the Temple Mount because you're just feeling that way today. You're at Hartman. You were at, had a class. You felt something good. You wanted to go to the Temple Mount. You can't. You can't, you can't go. And if you went, as a, and you looked too, too Jewishy, then they wouldn't let you, they would give you very limited time, surround you by police, and wouldn't let you pray up there. That's the situation. And if we would just stop, like, imagining things to be different. Now, the bad guys, they don't want to make it look like what they're really after is what? Ethnic cleansing of the Jewish people. They don't, they say that in Arabic plenty. Plenty. But they don't want to say that in English. They want to appeal to good folks, like, People in this classroom, and your parents, and even the teachers here. They want to appeal to that, and they want to say, no, 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 this isn't about jihad. We don't want to kill Jews. What do we really want? We really want a two-state solution. We want two, we want two, uh, we want a Palestine and Israel to live side by side. I can't find one map that they actually show a two-state solution, because every time I see any map, including if you buy in the old city, it's just a picture of Israel, exactly like Israel, but it says Palestine on it. What do you think that's supposed to mean? What is that supposed to mean to me? If I see a picture of Israel, the map of Israel, but it says Palestine, what do you think that means? Huh, I don't know, what could it mean? Do they want, maybe they want equal rights. Maybe they want, maybe they want to live, live side by side. And maybe they, uh, they don't like the occupation. Or maybe they just want to get rid of the whole occupation, which if you ask most of these jihad Arabs, you ask them, when does the occupation start? Have you ever asked an Arab? Ask, ask one of these Arabs that says the word occupation to you. Say, when did it start? They'll be damned if they don't say 1948. They'll always say 1948. Sometimes, if you're on CNN and you're a Palestinian Authority person, you'll say 1967, but that's so that the liberals will buy it. But, it, but on the maps, and, and among, even, even to you, they'll tell you straight out, the occupation starts in 1948. Okay. So now we have a situation where it all blew up in our face. All these conceptions blew up in our face. All these folks around the Gaza envelope who believed that everything was going to be honky-dory and all we have to do is keep giving them opportunities and rights and feed them in a million things, it blew up in their face. So now there's a new bad guy. Who's the new bad guy in Israel? Or who should be the bad guy? The bad guy in Israel should be the folks that for the last 30 years have been telling us, no, it's not important to have a lot of land. You can shrink. It's okay. Give them control of these places. Let's bring in Yasser Arafat. Give them control of huge chunks of land. Give them arms. Right? So obviously, people like myself have been saying forever how dumb that is. It's dumb to bring in your enemies and arm them. That's dumb. It's dumb to give them your ancestral homeland and let them take it over. That's dumb. It's dumb to give them Gaza to control. They're going to turn it into a, a forward haven of, 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 of jihadism. Don't do that. So now, the people who have been pushing that forever have a new bad guy. Who's the new bad guy? The Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox. That's the new bad guy. The reason October 7th happened, according to this new theory that's being pushed down the last two weeks, is because the Haredim didn't join the army. Not because you have been shrinking our army and have been pulling it out of places and letting the bad guys take over. No, that's not the problem. The problem with these black hatters, anyway, nobody likes them. They're weird anyway, right? So, you know, might as well, you know, and, and anyway, they're shirking their national responsibility. Let's blame them. Instead of looking inward and saying, Khatati, Aviti, Pashati, I have sinned in this horrible thing that we've allowed to happen in the last 40, 50 years, which is to give away our land to our enemies and not be strong in our land. All this business about occupation, all this business about rights, equalities, all this business is a veil. It's a sham. It's a show. It's a show to try to get nice Jewish kids like yourselves, smart Jewish kids like yourselves, to think that we haven't done enough and that we should give away more, give away more rights, give away more responsibilities. And, 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 and by doing this kind of appeasement, we'll somehow calm them down. It hasn't worked for over a hundred years. You know, in 1929 in Hebron, where I'm from, where I work, 1929, we had a riot. There was no Jewish state. There was no occupation. There was a tiny Jewish minority living in Hebron. And a riot came that killed 67 Jews. You know how they did it? Beheadings, rapes, stuffing the cook into, into the baker into the oven and burning him. Same stuff. Same exact stuff. For a lot of people in Israel, people are like, I can't believe how barbaric the Hamas are. And I'm like, you clearly do not read history. You just don't know what's going on. You don't understand this region. If you understood this region, had a little bit of a historical perspective, you know that that's what they've been doing for a long time to try to scare us, bully us, kick us off our land. My friends, I'm sorry to say this. The reason you're not in Hebron today is because you've been bullied off your land. 
That's the reason that you didn't go see the tomb of the forefathers and mothers, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac, Rebekah, Jacob, and Leah, which are the parents of all of us. Which are the parents of all of us. At the end, what are we Jewish? And even if there's people amongst you, I don't, you know, I don't know who's here in the crowd, even people who are not Jewish, everybody is the children of Abraham in the sense that we follow you know, the Abrahamic path in this world. My point is, is that why are you not there today? Because you've been scared off by people who don't want you to go there and connect with your land. They terrorize us. What is terror? What does the word terror mean? Terror is the broadcasting of fear. It's making fear go further. Like, probably you've never been in an attack in Hebron, right? Right? You have not been in an attack in Hebron, right? Am I guessing? But you have the fear of an attack in Hebron has spread to you or your group, and you're now not coming there. So I came here today because I didn't want to deprive you of a little bit of Hebron, okay? And not deprive you of myself, of course. Uh, and... And the, the, but the point is, is I want to be honest about what the situation is. We live scared. We live defensively. My counteroffer is, let's not live that way. My counteroffer is, let's live like Middle Easterners. Let's push back on the bad guys. Nobody wants to take away their land. We want our land. We want our land. And I'll, 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 I'll say the end right now, which is, there is a simple solution for peace. It's simple. It's so simple that smart kids cannot believe how simple it is. It's just this simple. A strong Jewish Israel on its land, surrounded by strong Arab countries on their land, working together for a better Middle East. No cutting away land, no giving away our ancestral homeland, no empowering the jihad. We live on our tribal ancestral lands. They live in their lands nearby, and we work together for a better future, like the Abraham Accords began to do like maybe we'll have with, with Saudi Arabia. That's the future. The future is not cut away your land. Now, I don't see any Asian folks here, uh, but, but uh, the reason I say that is because when there's Asian folks, a lot of times I say to them, I have a solution for you for the Taiwan problem, okay? You guys know what Taiwan is? It's a little, little island right out inside of big, big, big China, okay? It's a little island. Now, China wants to swallow up tiny little Taiwan. It wants to swallow it all the time. And Taiwan's like, no, we want to be independent, right? They kicked them out of the UN. You know that Taiwan is not in the UN? Lucky them, right? But they're not in the UN because, you know, China didn't want them there. So they're not in the UN. There's this tiny island. So I always may, I, when there's Asian people, I always say to them, here's a solution for Taiwan. Let's just cut half of Taiwan, the little tiny island, the cut in half, give it to China. I'm sure that will make China happy and satisfied. And everybody that's Asian always goes, ha, 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 that's absurd. That is so silly. Of course, that's a joke. Everybody knows that they want to eat us all up. If you give them half, they'll take the rest later. Same thing. I was in, I was in Washington, D.C., hanging out with a guy who's a Kurdish activist. Kurdish activist. Now, the Kurds are a people. They're a big people. Uh, and they don't even have exactly a country, but they have, Baruch Hashem, been able to eke out a little piece of independence existence in northern Iraq called... Uh, autonomous uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, okay? Who hates the Kurds? The Turks, the Syrians, the Iraqis, and the Iranians, and maybe there's a few others. A lot of people hate the Kurds for some reason. Why? Are they Muslim? Yes, they are Muslim, okay? But they don't like them for, for, for whatever Middle East reasons they have, right? So I was with this Kurdish activist in Washington. We were both lobbying. He was lobbying for Israel. If I was lobbying for Israel, he was lobbying for Kurdistan. I said to him, dude, what is your problem? You can make peace in a second. Just give parts of your land to Iran or to Turkey and you'll make peace with them. And then we laughed at how absurd it was. Ha ha ha, that's so dumb. How could you possibly believe that if you give a piece of your land to Iran, there's going to be peace? That's just stupid. Nobody in the Middle East actually believes that. No Middle Eastern type person. Okay? It's just silly. Of course, we and the Kurds have a related status. You know what our related status is? We are an armed ethnic minority. If you remember anything from this session today, I want you to remember this. Israel is an armed ethnic minority. That's what we are. We're a Jewish, that's a, that's a peoplehood, an ethnicity. We're a group living on a tiny piece of land. We're armed. We're an ethnic minority in a much, much bigger region. A much bigger region that stems all the way from you know, the western part of, 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 of North Africa uh, all, all the way to uh, uh, Iran. It, it's a humongous landmass. Okay, We are a tiny little tribe defending ourselves. That's all we are. And what do you do when you're a tiny tribe defending yourself? You make sure that people don't kill your people, don't rape your people, 
don't do bad things to your people. You hold on to your land. You push back on bad guys. That's the solution. It's so simple. Hold on to your land. Don't let other tribes infiltrate and take over. Don't give them huge advantages because the point of the state of Israel is to give advantage to our people. That's the point. To help you become that doctor and become a doctor at Hadassah and Karma and not Ahmed, God bless him. God bless Ahmed. But he's got 22 countries. And if he really loves Israel, sure, sure, he could stay and, 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 and make a life here. But this is not the point of the Jewish state of Zionism was to empower the Arabs. The Arabs, God bless them. Allah, I always tell Arabs, Allah loves you. He's given you 22 countries, oil coming out of the ground. How many, how many Arabs are there today in the world? Arabs, not Muslims. Do you know how many? What's your guess? Shh. That's true. How much would you guess? How many Jews are there in the world? Do you know? 13. Okay, 13, 14. Good. How many, how many are in Israel? Around half, that's right, 7 million, you're right. And how many Arabs do you think are in our region here? Throw out a number, it doesn't matter, believe me, it's fine. In Israel or in the Middle East? In the Middle East, in our, in our neighbors here. Like 17? The answer is 400 million. There are 400 million Arabs. It's all good, it's all good. 400 million Arabs surrounding us in 22 countries. And I didn't even say Muslims, because remember, Iran, they're not Arabs. Turkey, they're not Arabs. Okay, and there's also black Africa, which is Muslim, but not Arabs. Okay, so we are a tiny little people of 7 million, surrounded by 400 million of not our people. I'm not saying they're all our enemies. I am not saying that. But I am saying that we are surrounded, therefore we're an armed ethnic minority trying to keep our country safe. Okay, obviously, uh, obviously all this is predicated on other stuff, which I would have talked about if I would have talked, given my other talk, which is what is Israel predicated upon, which is predicated upon the Bible, the history of the Jewish people, the indigeneity of our peoplehood in the Bible as proved by archaeology and as proved by the fact that our peoplehood still exists and still carries these things. It's predicated on a nationalism, the right of ancestral peoples to live on their ancestral homeland, which is, by the way, the beautiful thing that happened at the end of World War I, which, which nations got to rule their land. We get to rule our land after World War I, just like many other nations were freed from the yoke of the Turkish Empire and other empires. Uh, we get to live in our land, and, and, and our land was recognized as ours. And the last thing is defense. Defense. The Jewish people have a right to defend themselves, and we must defend ourselves. Nobody's going to do it for us, including not President Biden or in, any international gathering. Nobody is going to defend us. Nobody's going to defend us. We have to defend ourselves. That's what never again means. It means never again shall we rely on others to defend ourselves. So Hebron happens to be a place that is the oldest Jewish community in the world, 3,500 years old. First property of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. Abraham purchased a plot of land there 3,800 years ago, buried his beloved wife Sarah. It's a love story. Okay? King David ruled there for seven years before he moves to Jerusalem. We have found, we have found from the, from the Hezekiah period, a little bit, like 100 years after David, we have found seals that say, Lamelech Hebron. What, what language did we find that in? Akkadian? Aramaic? Arabic? What language? Plain old Hebrew. Any kid could read it. Actually, the alphabet is different. That's true, though. But in any case, uh, 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 we have found remnants of our peoplehood in this land. We are from here. We are not foreigners. We are not occupiers. We are the ancestral tribe the, that lived in this land. By the way, one little thing is, one of the things that I disagree with, are you okay? You right? Everything's okay? Okay. So, one of the things that I, I think we should always be saying about Israel is, Israel, the third commonwealth. The third commonwealth. That's my recommendation to you. Write that down in your notes. The third commonwealth. That's what I recommend. I recommend we say, uh, 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 you know, or whatever you want to call it, or uh, how do you want to say third commonwealth? Uh, whatever you want to call it. Third commonwealth of the Jewish people. This is not our first rodeo. We did not get born here in 1948. The UN did not give birth to Israel. There's no greater lie in the world than the idea that the UN somehow gave birth to Israel. We were a nation in this land way before those other countries were even an idea. It's a joke. It's just a joke. This is our third time. This is our third time Jerusalem is the capital. And everybody should know that. Because if you don't know it, then, they, then, they, then, then, you, then you tell this American high school Jewish kid, you tell him, yeah, Israel's occupying Hebron. Are you joking me? Is that a joke? Occupying Hebron. We were in Hebron for 1,400 years before Islam was an invention. Okay? What a joke. 
What a joke. The Jewish people are white colonialists. Did you read the book of Esther? We're from freaking Persia. Okay, our forefather was, if was Abraham, was from Iraq. We are from this area. We're from this land. We have walked this land. We have archaeology. You scratch the surface, there is no pa- Palestine. There is no Palestine. You scratch the surface, you're going to find layers and layers of, of Jewish, Jewish uh, 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 life here in, in all the different eras. And now they're telling us that we're white colonialists? What a joke. And do you know why they tell us we're white colonialists? Do you know why? Because we act like it. We act like white colonialists. When you walk out of your land, when you talk about I'm willing to divide Jerusalem, when you, when you make all these kind of deals, when you walk out of Gaza, you're signaling, I don't really care. I don't really belong here. You're right. It's your land. And that sends a signal that we're thieves. And that's what they believe in American campuses today. That we're thieves. That we're white colonialists. So, there's been a failure in how we present these things and a failure in how we defend these things. And I hope to God that your generation, I hope that even, you know, my generation still will start to rectify this stuff and certainly your generation will start to getting back to a healthy Middle Eastern, Jewish, biblical attitudes that will keep us safe and make this whole region flourish. Thank you very much. Okay. Take this. Now, now I specifically cut my talking short so that I can... Uh, discuss with you what you guys think and your issues. And I see there's already questions. Ladies first. Hi. What's your name and where are you from? Keren Majdod. Mama, Keren? Yo, for Keren Majdod. I like Ashdod, but I like Ashkelon better. Okay. <laughs> That's just me. I just love Ashkelon. I love Ashkelon. I can't help it. I can't help it. I just love it. My mom is in an apartment there. I love it. Yeah. Um, so, like, you want to speak about. Oh, Hatan, לצמצם? שמעת ממני שאני רוצה לצמצם? אה, שחמאס רוצים לצמצם, אה, כן, 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 הם רוצים לצמצם, נכון, יופי, אוקיי, סורי, אני חושב שהיה לי חרדתק, אני חושב שאני 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 חושב את כנראה, את כנראה, את יודעת שאני איש ימין, כן? אני לא מאמין בכלל שיש להם שום שטח, אני לא מאמין בזכות שלהם על השטח הזאת, אני לא מאמין שיש כזה דבר פלסטין, אני חושב שהכל שקר וכזב, אין להם שום זכות היסטורית על הסיפור הזה, הכל כל קשקוש בלבוש. אז אני לא חושב, אני חושב שרק אנחנו לא מכילים את הריבונות שלנו על האדמה שלנו. הם דווקא מתפרסים בכל מקום, ועכשיו אני מדבר לא מן היירט, אלא מה... מהידע איפה שאני מסתובב ואני רואה אותם מתפרסים על כל הגבעות, תופסים שטח שהוא גם שטח של קק"ל, הוא בכל אופן, הוא שטח של מדינת ישראל. יהודה ושומרון זה הלב ההיסטורי של עם ישראל. פלסטינים זה עם שהתיישב פה עם הדורות בכל מיני דברים, לא הייתה להם שום מדינה ריבונית פה, שום דבר אחר, והם כמו אורחים פה. ואם הם רוצים לחיות בשלום, אהלן וסהלן. זה לא הארץ שלהם וזה לא האדמה שלהם, לפי ההסתכלות שלי כמובן. אוקיי? Okay? You mentioned the future of Israel with like peace deals, or peace deals and like trying to have strong Jewish land and a strong Arab land, right? And then you mentioned the Saudi Arabia deal, which I'm very like... Oh, there's no deal, but a, no, no, a potential no. Abraham continuation of yeah. Abraham Accords, yeah. And while that was very much on the table on October 6th, and it still is right now, except the change in the deal is that now the, the Saudis have said and other Arab countries have said that they want a Palestinian state in order for a peace deal. Yeah. So then how are we supposed to, let's say, achieve these peace deals if that's like their one now request? Have you, ever, have you ever haggled in the market around here? Have you ever been a Middle Easterner? I've have you ever haggled? Yeah, the other guy says, uh, you know, you know, <laughs> yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Let's go back a few steps. These are great questions. Let me ask you this. Why do the Saudis want peace with Israel? Why? Do they, do they start reading Rav Kook? What, what, what happened? Um, they, they, they believe in the writings of Herzl Makara. What, why do they want... Peace with Israel. Reasons, um, That's not the first reason. Defense. The, there's a lot of words. The first reason. The first reason is defense. Not defense deal with America. They need defense from whom? Iran. Not Iran. Okay. Iran. Okay. Okay. Iran. They want defense with from Iran. Why? Because Iran is the Shia of Israel. Right. Okay. And who is a better fighter? The Iranians or the Saudis? The Iranians are cream Saudi Arabia, like this, okay? 
Saudi Arabia have not even been able to deal with their own Houthi problem and all that, although the Houthis are a formidable enemy. But in any case, uh, the bottom line is that they look to see. Now this guy, this guy, what's his name? MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, he is looking around and he's thinking to himself, first thing, I want to defend my country. Second thing, I know that the oil is going to run out. So I want to make some smart economics right now, like my neighbors in the UAE, do some smart stuff. He looks around the region, who's going to be his partner, right? Now he could say, okay, no women drivers, we're going to do Wahhabism and Jihadism. It's like, how far is that going to take you, bro? How far is that going to take you? The oil's going to run out, you're not a good fighter. The other jihadis are better jihadis than you are, they're going to wash over you. So he thinks to himself, I need to kind of modernize, okay? So he looks and he sees a strong Israel. He says, woof! That's a strong country. They know how to fight back on the jihad. Now, the jihad is more dangerous to him than it is to Israel, right? The jihad, they always want to take him off because they think that he's a fraud. This Saud, house of Saud, took over the holy places. They, the, the ISIS, they want to get rid of him. About eight months ago, um, uh, they found, they captured about 82 uh, uh, ISIS folks, and on a Friday... They beheaded them, beheaded them, 82 of them, or 83, in the big, in, in Riyadh, in the big square, okay? He understands he's got a jihad problem. He looked to Israel, he's like, Israel, you're strong, good. We can do economics, good. You can help defend me. You can help defend me from a nuclear, Iran is a nuclear Israel, maybe, okay? You'll defend it, okay. Now, when we are weak, when he sees that the jihadis right next door know how to crush us, he thinks to himself, these guys are not as strong as I was hoping, I'm not as excited to make a deal because there's going to be political costs, but the Israelis are not as strong as I would have liked. Okay? They're a little bit weaker, all right? The, 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 the Hamas, what do they want to do? They wanted to derail this peace with Saudi Arabia because it would have legitimized Israel in the Muslim world. So they did everything October 6th to stop. That's one of the reasons why they wanted to attack because they wanted to stop that Saudi-Israeli deal. Okay, now let me ask you this. Does it make sense to you that the, another part of this deal would be that we also cut up another piece of land and hand it over to the jihad, a Palestine, like Karen wants, let's say, okay? It's like, do you, do you think it's a good idea? Do you, think it, do you think it's a good idea for us to like weaken ourselves even more and show the Saudis, yeah, 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 here, we're going to make a Palestine in our land so the jihadis, because like they took over Gaza, they'll take over the West Bank, squeezing Jerusalem like this, shooting down on Tel Aviv. So the Saudis say these things, and you know what you're supposed to say? Hell no. That's what you say to them. You want peace with me? I'm one of the richest countries, the strongest countries in the region. You want, you want a nuclear defense pact? You got it. Don't tell me to give up my land. You talk like that, I walk out. And when you talk like that, then there's something which Israelis have no clue about. I'm going to say a word which is very, very tricky. It's going to be hard for Israelis to understand this word. It's respect. You get a little respect around here. You respect, you push back at the bad guys. They tell you, let's divide Jerusalem. You say, if you say that word one more time, I never want to speak to you again. Don't talk to me about Yerushalayim. Don't talk to me about Yerushalayim. Well, after you did to me what you did in Gaza, we wiped you guys out like this. That's who we are around here. We're majnun. We're crazy. You don't mess with us. Okay? And then people are like, oh, that's a Middle East country. That's Israel. They're strong like, like we respect. But instead, we're wishy-washy. We're like Woody Allen all the time. Eh, take this land. Here you go. Okay, Palestine. Here's my homeland. Doesn't matter. Jerusalem, whatever you want. You look like a ninny around here. Okay, you look like a ninny. You look, look so weak. And so if you want to talk with the Saudis, talk with them in Saudi Arabia. Not in, not in, uh, not in uh, south of France. Talk like a Middle Easterner. Can I ask a follow-up on that? Quick follow-up. Um, so you're saying that we have to be like a Middle Eastern. And that makes sense to me, but also at the same time, the countries, have, <clears throat> the countries that have succeeded throughout our history are Western countries. And if Israel wants to act more like a Western country, then maybe they'll also get more success. Because they've done, the Western countries are known to have succeeded, while the Middle Eastern countries have often times not succeeded. Jack, that is a very good question. I appreciate that. And I'll answer you straight. You're right. There are elements of our country that are Western, and I'm not embarrassed about that. Uh, Western economics, free market economics, not centrally controlled economics. Western liberalism in the sense of individual freedom and individual rights. I accept that. Democracy, to a limited extent, is a good thing. It's got to be within, within borders that are not dumb, that you don't let bad people take over your country. But I agree with you. What I was talking about is defense. I wasn't talking about that we should be now, you know, everything Saudi Arabia is. I'm not saying that. Although it would be nice to be a little frimmer, a little bit more religious, okay? It would be nice if we had a little bit more respect for our holy places and not let people trample them and, and do whatever they want. Yeah, but you're right. There are aspects of Israel that people like myself respect as being, let's call it Western. There are elements of that. But when it comes to defense, no. 
When you're dealing with the other guy, you got to meet him not in a Western way. By the way, the West, when dealing with bad guys, used to know that you don't, you don't like go all liberal on them. You go hard on them. That's what they did in Japan. That's what they did with Germany. That's what they did when, when there was a war and somebody was attacking you. You took care of business. Today, they've become fuddy-duddy and, 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 and thereby also weak. Yes, sir. Oh, there's people on this side also. Go. Kenachi. Daber. Huh? Ma ken asot itam? Ma ken asot itam? Lo meat Palestinim ba ba Medina. Ken. Ma ma atsa shelcha Okay. Yeah, baby. Love Ashkelon. Love Ashkelon. I love that Ashkelon Park. Do you ever go to Park Ashkelon in the south? I love that place. Uh, that's that's my beach. Baruch Hashem is my favorite. Um, Huh? Ma, Zikim? Ma, Toberti. So, 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 Ido asks, who was Ido, by the way? Who is, what's this name, Ido? Where's that from? Isha Elohim. Nachon. Solid. So, 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 uh, so, Ido asks, uh, very fairly, okay, so, Isha, so, you, you give a whole spiel, where, what to do with the Palestinians, what to do with them. Again, Ido, to be honest with you, it's actually not so, so complex. It's really not so complex. I believe that the concept of resident alien, residency, the Hainu Mashin Kraba Torah, Ger Toshav. We had this concept three and a half thousand years ago. Ger Toshav. Toshav, resident, Ger alien. Resident alien, people that live in your land, that means they're from other tribes. They, this is the tribal land of the Jews. We have a system to defend ourselves and to help each other grow. Other minorities want to come live here. You have to respect my country, respect my flag, respect my peoplehood. If you act outside of that, you lose your rights and privileges. If you want to live in that, get residency. Get residency, you get to live here, get to work here, get to fly in Israeli passports, fine. But voting about it is a little bit different. Wait, wait let me ask you a question, Ido. Before I go on about voting, how many Arab countries have democratic voting? Out of the 22? Their own countries. Zero, okay. huh? Ephes. Ephes, okay? This much, okay? So they have zero democratic voting in their own country. That means that that's not a natural system to them. It's not a natural system. Therefore, I'm not going to come here out of the ashes of the Holocaust, Mia Shoah, to now bequeath voting rights on the Arabs. That's not what I'm here to do. Not what I'm here to do. I'm here to defend my peoplehood. So, Todarabah, thank you. Appreciate it. So, what to do with the Arabs? Residency for Arabs living in our land with rights and privileges for, for everybody who follows the law. Anybody who doesn't, anybody who speaks, thinks, puts a Facebook post of jihad, is out of here. He does not have a right to, to live in our land and to threaten us. Okay? Now, what about demo democratic rights? Okay. So, you cannot live here if you're a criminal who hates this peoplehood. You have to go. You have to get pushed out. You're going to have to find different places. You can go today. Today, there's many countries that are willing to welcome refugees. Scotland said they would, and Australia said they would, and Belgium said they would, and we know that many other countries take them in. But certainly the Arab countries have to be forced to take their brothers in because we're not going to accept people in our land that hate us. We're not going to accept people in our land that hate us. And by the way, Ido, look how hard it is to accept such a simple premise. It's a People who want to destroy your country from within should not be here. Lokashe. Right? Simple. That's what a proud Jewish state would be like. Now, uh, what about other options? I wrote an article, it's in the New York Times, A Settler's Vision for the Future of Israel, 2017, February, you could look it up, and it lists five alternatives to the two-state solution, five alternatives, including one that, I'm going to surprise you, there is a, there is a Palestine. Echamano, Keren. Psorot madimot. Yesh, yesh Palestine kvar. He kayemet, he kayemet. Ken, yesh kvar shnei medinot lashnei amim. המדינה הזאת קוראים לה ירדן, אוקיי? Okay? היא, היא על ידינו, היא המדינה ששם גרים 80% פלסטינים, היא מדינה שנלקחה משטח שהוא היה אמור להיות ישראל, דהיינו אנחנו כבר נתנו, שחררנו, לא יודע מה, בקיצור יש כבר מדינה פלסטינית נאה, קוראים לה ירדן, הכל בסדר. עכשיו אני לא אומר שצריך להעיף את כולם לירדן. I'm not saying, Ido, I'm not saying you have to kick everybody to Jordan. I say you want citizenship? You want to be like a full-fledged voting? They don't have voting, but whatever. You want to be... 
Go ahead, you can have your, your citizenship in Jordan, a Palestinian state, and stay here as resident, as long as you follow the law, as long as you respect our country. Don't try to take over. Don't bully our women. Don't, don't write posts about jihad. Don't do these things. You do. You're going to have to go to the real Palestine, which is Jordan or somewhere else, and, and, and you have to accept the fact that this is a Jewish state. That's all. Say it proud, and people will respect you. Ma shem v'mefa? Tohar mitkuma. אתה חושב שהשיח השתנה מכבוד השביעי לאוקטובר? אל תגידי לי, מה את חושבת? מה אני חושבת? אני חושבת שפשוט... She asked whether if, if the conversation has changed post October 7th. I'm asking her what she thinks. אני חושבת שהמון אנשים נפגשים באמצע, במצב של... דיברת על זה עם אבא שלי לפני שבועיים, שאמרתי לו שכאילו, הייתי רוצה לחיות פה בשלום, ואז הוא אמר לי, אוקיי, אז מה את עושה, כאילו, עם כל מי שלא רוצה לחיות איתך בשלום, והייתי כזה, לא יודעת, ואז הוא אמר לי, אז מה הפתרון? אני חושבת שהמון אנשים נמצאים במצב שאין פתרון לדבר הזה. כן. אז טוב, בוא אני אגיד לך משהו. So, so she says, she says that uh, she spoke with her father, and he said, well, what are you going to do with all the haters or the antis? And she said, I don't know. And he says, well, what's the solution? And they got stuck in the situation. Tar, I got to say something to you. The other side, they know what they're doing. While you and your father, God bless, are trying to figure it out, the other side is 100% sure what to do, which is to continue to take over the land, continue to take over the Yehudah V'Shemron, continue to take over Aza, continue to arm themselves in, in Lebanon, continue to take over the bus, all the busing in Israel is now Arab drivers, the Beit Cholim, the, what do you call it, the, uh, the uh, uh, new, um, uh, first response rooms, Huh? Huh? No, no, how do you say it? Terem, all the terms, the, I took my son to a terem, it was like all Arabs, was not very comfortable, frankly, I'll be honest with you. And I don't have a problem with Arabs, but like, it was not comfortable for me. You know, I don't have a problem with Arabs. I don't have a, 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 a cultural. I feel close with Arabs. That's one of the things that, you, that a lot of times people don't understand. They think that right-wingers don't like Arabs. The opposite. I'm like an Arab. I, I, I'm like them. I, 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 don't have a, I don't have an ethnic problem. The opposite. It's because I'm like them, I understand how they think. I don't, I don't have a problem with their way. I just understand that they're trying to push in to my society and I've got to push them back. I respect the fact that this is their region. I respect... We should do the same. Huh? So we should do the same. We should push them out, the ones that hate us, yeah. Absolutely. I, I respect that. I respect that they understand the rules of the Middle East and I don't respect people who act like white colonialists who think you can just negotiate everything and, and, and just give them a little bit of land and appease them. I think that that's dumb and you don't understand the ways of this region, those kind of people. And so, yeah, I, I think that they're childish and, and, and have led to tragedy here, have led to uh, giving away Gaza was an example of total idiocy and which basically that land became filled. So, so the Arabs were subjugated there the jihad took over, the kids were brainwashed, the tunnels were built, the attack came, and they're still doing it. So yeah, I think that that's dumb. Um, bottom line is, the other side, they are sure what to do. Okay? So what we have to do is a little bit more sure. This is our piece of land. You got to defend it. Don't let the bad guys in. Don't let them take over your land. I understand that it is like, our, like we were there and all of that, but what's the sense of holding a couple of Jewish settlements surrounded by... Hostile yeah, don't let them be hostile. That's the answer. So why not evacuate them and then give them Gaza? How, how did that work? How did that work? You tell me now. Itamar, come on. You're a hard man. You're a smart kid. Just tell me. Did that work out good or not? Again, I, I, I asked you a question. Answer me. <laughs> yes or no? Did it work out? You threw out a solution. Does it work or not? You threw out these... Why not? It didn't work, but we should do it better. Oh. The Prime Minister should do a better job in holding them. But originally, it's not a better, the best idea to hold a Jewish settlement in the Arab, like, hostile... Israel is a Jewish settlement in an Arab hostile area. Israel is a Jewish settlement in a hostile Arab area. Tzemizeh. You can't walk away from your land, and you can't always be... So, it's such a ghetto thinking, ghetto. Well, let me go back. They don't like me. Go back, go back, go back. I'll live in my little Tel Aviv ghetto, and everything will be okay, I hope. Die. Be big. I have a statement. Go, go big and go home. Okay? Okay? Go big. Be big. Be chazak. Push back and back, guys. That's the only way to make it around here. I'm supporting that, but I just, just think that we should give them... We we save borrowers inside of Israel right now if we're the rest of the rest bank and just give Gaza because we don't need it. You don't need it. I need it. 
I need it. I need, because, because first thing, it's our ancestral land. And second thing is because we grow things there. And our children grow there. And it's the best beaches. And it's our land. And it gives us more defense. The bigger we are in our land. The bigger we are in our land. Not their lands. Nobody's talking about taking over Egypt. Egypt is Egypt. The bigger, by the way, if, is there a good map of Israel around here? I wish I would have brought it, but I've been so busy. If, I, if, I, if, I, if you would open up a map, it's so obvious what the borders of Israel are. You know, natural borders. The, na the natural borders of Israel are from the Suez, including the Sinai, until the Jordan Valley, up to the mountains of Lebanon. That's the small, tiny Israel. That's the natural borders. You can't defend it. And Itamar, for God's sakes, how, how could you now, in this, after October 7th, throw out like, yeah, you know, let's not have little summits, walk out of there. Give them the we did that. That's exactly what we did. We did that to the best in realistic terms that could be done. And it was an abysmal and awful failure. As bo 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 nakhlif disk. Yes, sir. I'm uh, Jeremy from Chicago. Okay. Um, Where from? Rogers Park? No, further north. Um, Is that not a big Arab area also? Oh, that's Dearborn, Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not so far, not so far away. Yeah, not, not so far, yeah. Um, you mentioned how the land Deerfield. swap in Gaza was a complete failure, but when we look at the land swap. Land swap? It's not swap, sorry. The land the giveaway. Land yeah, yes. not back. Not bad, because there was never a Hamas Palestine beforehand. We gave it away and, get, and created, helped create that. Let's use terms properly, okay? That way we know what we're talking about. To the giving land for the Sinai, the Sinai Peninsula, oh. which did lead to peace. Oh. How do you see that as a different... Wait, I forgot your first name because I... Jeremy. Jeremy, right, okay. Jeremy, you hit, you hit, you hit, you hit my, uh, you hit my, uh, my landmine, okay? Okay? You hit my landmine. Okay. <laughs> I, you know, I usually don't, I try not to go into this because I see that people, it's hard for people to understand it. The biggest sin, the biggest sin that Israel ever did was the Sinai giveaway. That was the beginning of the biggest mistake that we're living with today. Sinai to Sadat, who was clear, cl very quickly murdered. Let me ask you this. Does Sinai belong to Egypt historically? The answer is no. Go to the Bible. Remember when you leave Egypt, you go to the Sinai because they're two separate things. Did you look at the map? Sinai and Egypt are connected by this, okay? The people that live in the Sinai, who lives there? Egyptians? No, Bedouins live there. Do they like the Egyptians? No, they hate each other. Hate, hate. Bedouins hate the Egyptians, okay? The Sinai is not Egypt. That's just the first thing. Second thing is, the land, this, Israel was a big, badass Jewish state with the Sinai. With oil fields, with air fields, with controls of two sea lanes of the, of the Red Sea. Uh, the, the, the port of uh, the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba, okay? Like this, we controlled, we were big, badass. Had a big country. You don't mess with us, okay? And that's what happens when you mess with us. We hold on to this land, which is our land anyway, but we hold on to it nice and big and good. Then Begin came. And Begin, he wanted to be a country that looked good, seemed moral, was peaceful, was willing to do everything for peace. Peace, 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 peace. I read when, it, when I see his writings about peace, I start to like want to puke. I'm like, dude, the way you have peace, peace around here is when you're strong. We gave away the Sinai. Egypt never became pro-Israel. It's one of the most anti-Israel countries. They teach the most amount. The number one selling book there is still uh, Protocols of the Elders of Zion and Mein Kampf. That's on the streets of, 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 of Egypt. The Sinai became filled with a passageway for arms and other things that ended up in the hands of Hamas, including another thing, which is African migrants and other things that all come through the Sinai. Okay? The Gaza is always fed through the, the Sinai. And then we already gave the idea that we are going to kick out Jews from their homes, shrink our country because we're going to be a good country, not a strong country. Okay? And it was the biggest failure that led to this way of thinking. Since the 1982 Sinai Accords with Egypt, we have only become, become weaker and weaker and weaker. We haven't won a war since the Six Day War. Okay? We haven't won one war. We have, we have shrunken in size. Our economy has grown, our people have grown, Baruch Hashem. But in terms of the country's you know, size and defenses, we're shrinking like this all the time. 
And we already, and, and Begin already came up with the idea of the autonomy in Judea and Samaria, i.e. the creation of a Palestine down the line in our ancestral homeland. So to me, people like me think that Sinai was the first and biggest mistake. We didn't really make peace with Egypt. It wasn't a real peace with Egypt. With the UAE and Abraham Accords, we have started to make real peace. We didn't give them anything. We didn't give them. We didn't give away any land. We didn't do anything. We just said, "Listen, we have economic and defense pacts that could g get together." Sinai was a tragedy. It was a nightmare. It was the. It was what's called in Christian the. Uh, 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 um, what's it called? Original sin. That's the original sin. The original sin was Bagans. After that, we kept sinning and sinning and sinning. Oslo Accords. Disengagement. Us ninety three. Oslo Accords. Two thousand five. Disengagement. It's all part of the same. A horrible mistake. I understand what you're saying about like not giving up more land and Come on, Shah no Vuksha. And also Start asking some hard questions. Let's go, come on. Okay. Just joking, just joking. Come on, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I also agree that giving up more land is not necessarily the right answer. <laughs> but I do really think that just like force forcing people out of the land that they also live here now. Only forcing bad guys out. Haters. Not regular people. People who hate you. People who want to destroy you. It's a tribal region. I'm not saying kick out people. I'm saying people who hate like, you. And not letting them vote. And what does vote mean? What does vote mean? We, we have a system that we created for our peoplehood in order to run this country. This is a Jewish state. I, I, you, want, you want to create votes? There's many different ways. I'll give you an example. Puerto Rico. You know Puerto Rico? Is it a state or not a state? Not a state. Are the people living there citizens? Yes, they are. Do they have a right to vote for American president? No, no they do not. Well, like, what happened? Why? Because it's a territory, it's being administered differently. Do they, here's a tricky one. Do they vote for congressmen and senators? Yes. Yes, they do. They don't vote. That's right. Very good. Okay, but they, that's right. So they have congressmen and senators, but they are non-voting, i.e. they come there to Congress, say their thing, talk about their problems, which is what a congressman or a senator is supposed to do, but they don't have a right to vote because that territory doesn't have the right to vote. That's America. That's America. And how dangerous are Puerto Ricans? They're not. Okay, there's two million Puerto Ricans. They're not dangerous at all. But they've decided that this region has a different specialized uh, demo democracy situation for whatever reason. I say people who are dangerous to us shouldn't exactly decide where our country is going. By the way, the Knesset members that we have, the Arab Knesset members, they're... Some of, some of them are vile anti-Semites, vile anti-Israel folks, like terrorists. Uh, uh, Azmi Bouchard, I remember him? He had to run away because we caught him you know, being promoting terrorism. He was a Knesset member. And there's more and more and more. Please self, please self. There were Knesset members of some of the worst. So they sit on our committees. They get our intelligence. So I say, don't be dumb. Don't be dumb. You want them to vote? I can say, I can, you tell me that we can have municipal elections, that they can vote their own judges, their own people. They can have their own thing in their regions. Fine. You want, to, you want them to have Knesset members? Fine, but let them be non-voting Knesset members. Or say there's a certain amount. The Arab population can have three Knesset members to, to make sure that people hear their problems. But let's be smart and defend ourselves. But do you really think that by minimizing them and like, like, I just, I think in theory, like having it <coughs> as the Jewish state, like I agree. I just, I don't see how after all these years we can like continue to like put them down like that and expect to like, have peace. Molly, everything that we do to give them more opportunities blows up in our face. You have to, at some point, re see the truth. They take the thing that you give them, the inch, and they want a mile. They do not, nothing that you do ameliorates them. There's nothing you can do to appease them. They have a different, we have an ethnic conflict. We have an ethnic religious conflict. This is not about rights. They don't want more rights. They don't want more land. They have an ethnic religious conflict against us. It is against Islam to have a Jewish state in the middle of their land because of two reasons. One, Judaism is supposed to be replaced by Islam. And two, is that any land that was once Islamic, which this land was, cannot become the land of somebody else. You have to liberate it. That's called Dar el Kharb. You're not allowed to give up land. So therefore, you have to accept this, Mali, you have to accept this. It's an ethnic, religious conflict. And it's not going to be mollified by, by all kinds of uh, 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 ways to appease them. It just won't happen. How do you expect American college students to go back, like, with your ideology, to go back to... Wait, what was your first name again, though? Karen. Karen. Oh, another Karen. Okay. Karen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. Um, really? Yeah. That's cute. Yeah. <laughs> 
How do you expect us to, like, with your ideology, to go back to college campuses and prove that Jews aren't trying to commit this? That is the dumbest thing I ever heard. No, because like, <laughs> where are we? How are we committing a genocide? How are we? How? Because they want to. They want to make you look bad. They want to. They want to darken your whole. They want to make your country look like a. Okay. Okay. You know what, Karen? I'll give you a better answer. Okay. Yeah. I take back everything. No, it's Karen. Okay. Karen, check this out. It was, it was a Karen. Karen, listen to me. In the Middle Ages and all the way up to the 1900s, there was this thing called the blood libel. The blood libel was a way for Christians at the time, and also Muslims, but mostly Christians, to say that Jews are bad. Here's what they do to our babies. They shecht our, they, they, they slaughter our babies, they use them for matzah. What's happening today is a modern blood libel. It's a modern day blood libel. Are we murdering, uh, are we doing ethnic cleansing or genocide on the Arabs? I don't think we are. Okay, so you're for, the, the, the folks on campus are, they have what's called a weaponized narrative. They've weaponized the narrative. They have a narrative that Israel is bad. Now Israel, everything Israel does is bad. And we've actually, we've in many ways allowed that weaponized narrative to metastasize. Yeah. Nothing that I say now, nothing I say good or bad will affect the, the weaponized narrative against you out, out there on campus. The only thing that you could do is, A, hang out with good people who don't hate Israel. B, if somebody's in your face, you know, if you can't push them back, Either ignore them or do not deal with them. Or, or if somebody's like, you know, in your face, then you got to know how to beat them back up so that they don't beat you up, okay? And, and basically, we have to fight a narrative that our, sti that our country is allowed to metastasize. But, ba but basically, it doesn't matter what my ideology is. Because again, as I was telling Molly, it doesn't make any difference because no matter if you say to them, no, we want to be... Let me tell you a story. Can I tell you a story? Who likes a story? You like a story? Here's a story. I haven't told you enough stories today. But I have so many stories and I haven't even told you any stories. Here's a story, okay? One time I was working at a radio station here and I get a phone call on my phone and it says Qatar is calling. Who's calling me from Qatar? I don't have any girlfriends in Qatar. What, what do you, who, who do you think is calling me from Qatar? Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera. I'm a media, okay? So Al Jazeera is calling. So I'm like, I, 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 I accept the call. And of course, it's like a British accent. Hello, Mr. Fleischer. You know, we really would love it if you... It was during one of these Gaza wars. I don't remember which one even. And, and they go, uh, oh, it was after the three boys were, were kidnapped and murdered. And, uh, and, uh, and they, they call me into the studios. And I said, sure, I'll come down to discuss the war. So they say to me, uh, you come down to the to technological park here in Malcha. And that's where they have studios. Fine. In the meantime, I have a, a, a reporter, a friend of mine. And, I, and I'm going to call him for the, for the conversation. I'm going to call him Bill, okay? So I said to him, I go, Bill, Al Jazeera is calling me. And uh, what do you think I should say? So Bill says to me, he says, you should tell them that we're doing our very best not to hurt the civilians. And we're like m making sure that civilians aren't injured and stuff like that. And we're like doing our best to fight a moral war. I said to him, Bill, that is the dumbest thing I ever heard. He says, why? I go, because the minute I'm going to say we're trying so hard not to hurt civilians, they're going to show images of a kid being pulled out of the rubble with his hand hanging out, okay, and his eyeball hanging out. And they're going to be like, you are the biggest liar, Ishai and Israel. So, I, so he says to me, so what are you going to do? I said, watch this. I go to Al Jazeera. So I know that they have the image already waiting, you know, that video. So they go, Mr. Fleischer, Mr. Fleischer, you know, how, how is it that, that uh, only 70 Israelis have been killed and almost 3,000 Palestinians? So they're ready for me to be like, wow, well, we're trying really hard to like, make sure the civilians aren't hurt, you know? I'm trying to give that whole Israeli, like, we're a moral army crap narrative, okay? So instead I'm like, I said to them, I said to them, yeah, that's what happens when you start with us. You mess with us, you mess one hair on, on one of our kids, we crush you 10 times as hard. Don't start with us, okay? That's what Israel means. We're here to defend our peoplehood. We're post-Holocaust people. Shoot one rocket, you'll get 10 in your face. They were like, uh... And they were like, should I play that video now with the kid? They were totally stuck. And then they tried it again. Later on in the program, they go, they go uh, Mr. Fleischer, how is it that... Uh, that I don't know, whatever, 10,000 rockets were, were, were sent in Israel and only uh, 70 people were hurt, something like that. So I'm like, I have to take off my, my press hat and put on my rabbi hat. I said to him, it's min Allah. God protects the Jews. 
You think, do you think Hamas doesn't know how to shoot rockets? It's on video, all this stuff. Yeah, I said, do you, know, do you think Hamas doesn't know how to shoot rockets? God, Allah swipes them away to protect the Jewish people. You are doing against the will of Allah. They were like, uh, they were totally stuck. Instead of giving them the sissy answer that, yeah, we're really trying hard and all that, that never buys you one friend. I gave them what they respect, which is strength. Push back on their narrative. Tell them, you start with us, that's what you get. Don't mess with the Jewish state. We're majnun. That's the way to talk with them. They respect that. So I, I get the whole thing, what you're saying. It's like, you have to act crazy. You got to be Middle East. You got to live in the Middle East. We're here. You got to be strong. Just, so that's basically it. Strong. Yeah. yeah. But, so how do you think that works with how we're seeing how Western countries react? when we even do like a slight fraction of not even really being strong in this war, of just being like kind of even average, how like average country would react, versus if we were to be strong, we still, I'd love to see this if I could be fully independent, but we still need the codes for the F-35s every morning. We need to replace with parts of the F-16s. We need all these things, we need the bombs. Like, we do need support from other countries. How do you think other countries would react if your ideology was fully implemented. Fruition. Good question, Avi. It's a good question. Well, so let's break it down. First thing is, you said it in your question, which is, we have allowed ourselves to become very dependent. Mm -hmm. I, I, by the way, am not an America hater. I like America. And I have many good friends, and I think America is a great country in many ways, and I like our relationship. But it's too much. It's too much. It's too dependent. We should have other suppliers and other things, including us being the supplier. Okay? We should make stuff we, should, we, we could have made our own jets, but that was quashed by the Americans. We, could, we have to be more independent. We have to have our own rockets. We have to have our own munitions. We have to have more of that stuff. And if you can't get it from America, get it from somebody else. The Czechs and the this and the that. There's other people who make stuff. Be cool. Don't become a puppet state. That becomes a strategic, shh, that becomes a strategic danger. To Israel, when we're too dependent, especially America, which one day you have a Trump and the other day you have a Biden. It's a, it's a place that things switch around. So you can't have too much dependency on that country because when you do, you could get in trouble. That's, that's, that's number one. Now, so economically, would you like it to shift more towards trade with... With everywhere. Countries First thing, our trade is, 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 with, our trade is also with Europe and, of course, with the Middle Eastern countries. Israel's, Israel's global. Okay? Israel's got to be global. I'm saying America's great, but don't overdo it. Don't become too dependent on those guys. That's number one. Number two is that, I say this with, with, with respect to the United States, Obama-Biden, that, 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 that way of thinking, are antithetical to Israel. They want to shrink Israel and make it weak. That's what they want. That's what Obama wanted. That's what Biden wants. I, I think Biden wants a weak Israel. And he wants a Palestine in their ancestral homeland. And, he, and he's got an affinity to Iran. He helped get billions of dollars over to them. And so he is not a friend to Israel in my understanding. Okay? Trump also, huh? Trump also attempted a peace plan. No, I'm talking to you about now, he, he, Trump tried to shut down Iran and, 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 and the nuclear bomb. And let's not, the Trump peace plan was, it was a Jewish invention, but let's, let's talk about that later. The, the bottom line is that, the bottom line is you, you ask me, how do other countries respond? So first thing I say, I agree with you, that's why I don't build such a dependence on them. Two, I want to say something to you that's, gonna, that's, that's, that's different than what I said before, which is like this. I have a lot of friends in Congress, okay? And I have a lot of friends who work in Congress, okay? Now, do you know what congressmen on the Republican side have been saying to me and my friends? They're like, you guys, why are you not standing up to Biden? If you would stand up to him, we could support you. Why are you being so quiet? Say no. Say, like, no, this is unacceptable, what, what you're pushing on us. And by the way, Netanyahu has started basically saying that. But they're like, hey, like, like, like Biden sanctioned four Israelis that like, are basically have no criminal record and are like just settler kids out there. I know some of them, you know? Like for, and that's a, such an abrogation of our sovereignty. We let that slide. The Americans are saying to us, fight, and we'll back you up. Show them that this president is anti-Israel and we'll support you and say, look, this president is anti-Israel. There are millions of Americans who are pro-Israel for real, i.e. pro-strong Israel, not pro-weak Israel. So A, diversify your portfolio. And B, again, comes back to be strong and people will respect you. Your allies will stand up for you.
I just wanted to ask, you mentioned the... Sorry, I'm interested in these things. These are... Okay. Sociology is interesting to me. Yeah. You mentioned the Puerto Rico model, if I understood correctly, is something which we might be able to apply here. Um, it, it, it was more of an example, just to clarify, it was more of an example that even the great democracy of the United States has different settings when it needs to. Yeah, you would support some kind of localized, non-threatening autonomy, theoretically. Not autonomy, but, but local rule. So how local does rule. That, how does that... Uh, contradict with, for example, the Begin Peace Plan because, or the Begin Autonomy Plan, because I'm not familiar with the details and what makes you object to Begin's plan that supports some kind of self-rule. I'm not for Palestinianism, and I'm not for too much. I'm not for when I say self-rule is like this. Let's say you have a big Arab town like Abu Ghosh. A lot of Arabs that are pro-Israel. Okay, you want to have your own mayor. You want to have your own system? So I, don't have your own, I have no problem with that, as long as you guys are pro-Israel. So I, I wouldn't overly use the big words of autonomy and all that. I'm not for anybody else's sovereignty or autonomy in my ancestral homeland. Okay? I am for, if you're pro-Israel, but you have your own way of doing things, because you have a different culture, and you, let's say you're, you're Druze. You have your own religion, you have your own uh, Qadi or whatever it is, whatever you know, kind of system going on. I just can respect that. I don't have to be in your kishkas. If you have a different way, but as long as you are non-jihadist and you respect our law, and if our law and our law beats your law, if there's a problem, if there's a conflict between your law and the state of Israel law, the state of Israel law trumps. But in simple terms, respect our country, and we will respect your way. I got no problem with minorities living in my land. I don't need everybody to be. It's not some kind of ethnic purity that we're looking for here. I have no problem. But you have to respect. You have to be a good ger toshav, a good resident alien. Okay. But of course, if you live in a Chevron and you're cool with the Jews and you want to have your own thing, okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm Danny. I'm from Tel Aviv. Um, I have a question to you about the beginning of your uh, thing. Um, you talked about like if <coughs> our strength is in our unity, then is it not the problem with the equality and the burden of the IDF or the taxes ah. between Haredi? Yeah. That made the seculars go into believing that the Arab community is a greater ally than the Haredi. He asked, he asked, is the burden of the burden of the burden of the burden of let me just say, before I even answer that question, let me just ask you, what's in Donnie, what did you say, Danny? Donnie, let me ask you this. Are the Arabs a, 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 a better ally than the Haredim or not? I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but I, as, as an Israeli, as a Jew, I believe that if we decide to create a country that is Jewish and Israeli, we should all, as Jews and Israelis, work together. And we have Arabs that have different, a different... Um, do they have Shivyon Banetel, by the way? The Arabs do a lot of army? No, but you, you don't... I'm just asking. You said that they're better, potentially better at... Potentially. Mazal al Cholim. Mazal al Cholim. Ah. He did okay. Ah, nachon. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let me... Let, my time is limited, so... Chavrim, I'll tell you. Guys, guys, this is... Listen, listen to me. I want to answer your question, so yeah, I, it's not that I want to cut you off, it's because of the time, I promise you. This is a very good question, I'd love to, could, we could talk about this, which you're talking about for, for 40 minutes, easy. But I'm going to give you my short answer, okay? Short answer is, the, the Haredim are not big blue and white Zionists, it's true, but they're not our enemy, okay? They're not our enemy, they have a different culture, they have a different brand, it's, a lot of it is about branding, and remember, in Tel Aviv, there is a Haredi Tel Aviv, it's called Bnei Brak, it lives like this, and... and there's a coexistence there, that's fine. There's like a line, but okay. Here's the bottom line. I agree with you that there should be a Shivyon Banetel, and I have a plan. I have a plan. It's a very, again, I love, you're going to hear speakers here throughout the year that give you sophisticated answers. I love simple answers. Intellectually speaking, I prefer simple things than complex things. That's just my shita. My shita is let's simplify. Okay? Here's my simple answer. I agree with you. I have a plan like this. Everybody in the country, and I mean everybody, does two years. Everybody, boys, girls, Haredim, Arabs, anybody who lives in our land does two years. But two years could be a lot of different things. It could be very much any amuta has a right to have 
שירות לאומי. אין היא עמותה. So a Haredi Amuta that has a, has a good Amuta that's recognized by the state can have Shirut Lumi and Haredim can work there. Everybody's going to come out, everybody with a, with a Tuda that says, I served two years. Ain't because of the Vayot Sedofen. Yot Sedofen, you go to jail, okay? But if you're not a Yot Sedofen, then you're going to do whatever you want. Also, there's some Yeshivot for some Yiluim that are also Shirut Lumi because that is a Shirut. That is also a Shirut. That's a shirut for our nation to keep, you see all these books, not everybody knows all these books. It's a shirut that we have some people that know all the books. That's also an intellectual shirut that some, some of our people do. But we generally speaking have this thing, everybody gets equalized. There's no Arabs that could go at 18 to college. And because of the you're, 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 you're a resident of Israel, you have to do uh, two years. We equalize that. But to make it, the th- that's my plan. That's the Yishai plan for Shivion Benetto. And it's really Shivioni. No, there's no... Ah, you want to do more? Bevakasha. You, to to, you want to go to the army and to, and to be in the fighting units? You get more tosefet. You get, you get more money. You get more respect. You get more money. But a Haredi guy is going to take out of his wallet a, a Medinat Israel card of, that I did my Shiru Lumi. No exceptions. Kula Matodava. Except for, of course, if somebody's sick or whatever it is. But Kula Mosim Matodava. Okay? That's a simple answer. But... Don't make the mistake that this, to make the mistake that this problem is like the biggest problem of Israel. It's a problem. Haredim have a different culture. This not, we have a problem. But it's not like this is what caused October 7th. Okay, that's shtiyot b'mitzah g'vaniyot. Leaving our land and giving to the terrorists, that's what caused October 7th. Okay? And also, by the way, coming closer to a little bit more of a heritage, a Jewish heritage, a little bit more spirituality, a little bit more religion. Do you know, by the way, what the Torah says? What does the Torah say how to make sure that nobody's going to want your land? Do you know what the Torah says? Anybody? Yeah, yeah, but there's a specific thing. It was in Parsha Kitisa. Anybody know what the Torah says? Huh? There's, there's no, there's, there's ten. What do you mean? What do you mean? You mean what? Of, of things that won't have our land taken away? There, no, there's, spe- there's a specific list. Kitsar, I just, because of out of time, the Torah says, come three times a year to Yerushalayim. Come to Aliyah three times a year to Yerushalayim, and nobody will want your land. אני אמרתי כל היום דיברתי לא על תורה, כל כל השעה וחצי עכשיו דיברתי, לא הזכרתי את התורה בכלל, עכשיו בסוף השיחה אני מזכיר תורה לדקה, את אומרת לי יש דבר שלא מבוסס על תורה, כל השעה וחצי, לא הזכרתי את התורה, לרגע אחד אמרתי עם רעיון, רציתי לגמור עם קצת יהדות, ופתאום הפכתי ל... כאילו אני דיברתי עכשיו עם התנ״ך ומשיח כל היום. מה? מה קרה? I'm out of time guys, I want to thank you very much, wait, 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 I'm out of time, I just want to say this, first thing is, Marry Jewish, okay? 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 Very important. Please marry Jewish. Thank you. Okay? And have beautiful Jewish babies. That's number one. Number two is that we, uh, we, we very much invite you uh, to, uh, to, to, to choose to live in the state of Israel, in the land of Israel. Of course, our Israeli brothers and sisters, you know, if you've got to go working in the malls in America for two years, okay, but not much longer than that, you know, come back and, and, and come and... And, and build our country. There'll be plenty of space, plenty of everything for you. Uh, and finally, it's very easy to stay in touch with me, Yishai Fleischer, on Twitter, YouTube, etc., all the stuff. So it's easy to stay in touch with me. And I bless you to have a great day. Continue your good work. <laughs>